And now today's featured speaker is Jessica Jolio, class of 2005. Jessica is a recognized marketing innovator, international speaker. She's currently dialing in from London and co-author of The Power of Visual Storytelling and the Laws of Brand Storytelling. Professionally, Jessica has led innovative digital marketing, public relations, and social media programs for companies including Dunkin' Donuts, TripAdvisor, State Street, Comcast, and Sprinkler, work that has resulted in numerous industry awards. Today, Jessica is the co-founder of With Savvy Media and Marketing, a strategic branding, storytelling, and growth marketing consultancy. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming Jessica Giulio. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, well, thank you so much for that great introduction, Emily. It is wonderful to be here today. I'm going to share my screen and let's get this in. Perfect. Well, I had a great intro plan, but I think you've already helped me get this rocket and rolling. So let's dive right in. All right, let's get this going. Perfect. So as mentioned, I am Jessica Giulio, and today I'm here to speak with you about the new rules of brand storytelling. And just a bit, bit of key, quick housekeeping on my end is if you want to engage on social media during this presentation, I always love hearing your feedback. I'm on Twitter at Savvy Bostonian and Instagram as Jessica Jolio. And don't fret, these are at the bottom of every slide. So if you uh, don't grab them now, you can grab them later. So with that said, you know, as Emily mentioned, um, I am a member of the Bentley class of 2005. This is actually me on my graduation day from Bentley with my very proud parents. And while at Bentley, I majored in marketing and I minored in IDCC or information design and corporate communication. And I have spent my career working across both of those fields, actually, um, from Comcast to State Street, TripAdvisor, Dunkin' Donuts, Sprinkler, and my limited company with Savvy Media and Marketing, where I am, work as a marketing consultant. And I also have co-written two books, The Power of Visual Storytelling, which teaches you how to use different visuals and videos on social media to market your brand. And then our more recent book, The Laws of Brand Storytelling, which is why I'm here today to speak with you about all things storytelling. And I've had the wonderful honor of co-authoring both of these books with Ekaterina Walter, who is such a dear friend of mine and is a marketing innovator who has worked at amazing companies like Accenture, Intel, YPO, and many more. So with that said, let's jump in. So what excites me about storytelling is that humans have actually been telling stories since the beginning of time. And there's a good reason why. Stories spark our emotions. They help us to better understand and empathize with one another. So think about a day in your life, a week in your life. Chances are it's filled with stories. You know, when we as humans come together, whether that's in person or virtually, we bond over stories. And examples of this could be bonding over kind of what your new normal is like, or kind of getting nostalgic about some of those great vacations you were taking in the past and hope to take in the future. But think about this as the rest of your week goes on. Chances are you'll see many of your conversations and interactions are actually framed around stories. And there's an interesting reason why. So we as humans are actually hardwired to favor storytelling. Our neural activity actually increases by five times when listening to a story. So much so that storytelling actually lights up the sensory cortex in your brain so you can feel, hear, taste, even smell the story. So a challenge for you is the next time that you're listening to a story that you really, that really sparks something in you, think about, can you kind of see the story happening in front of you if, if someone's saying it to you verbally? Can you smell something? Are there other sensory elements that you feel when you hear that story? That's a sign of a great story. But interestingly, if people love a brand story, it also moves and motivates them to take action. So research from Headstream shows that 55% of people are more likely 
to buy a product in the future if they love a brand story. 44% will share the story and 15% will actually buy that product immediately. So what makes a great brand story? Well, I'm so glad you asked. A great brand story moves and motivates people to take action. I wanna share an example with you from Paul and Paul's Boots. Now, Paul was from Australia and he loved hiking. He had size 13 hiking boots and dreamed of hiking the Appalachian Trail, which runs from Maine to Georgia. And, you know, unfortunately for Paul, despite his dreams and aspirations, he had a heart condition and he was unable to actually complete his dream of hiking the Appalachian Trail before he passed away. Now, when his wife, Malin, had to go through the really difficult task of going through his things after he passed, she came across those size 13 hiking boots and said, I have to do something with these. I can't just throw them away or donate them or get rid of them. I, I wish I could do something meaningful with them. And that's what sparked an idea. She decided to call into a podcast that Paul had loved called The Dirtbag Diaries. And she asked them on the podcast, you know, Paul's dream was to, to hike the Appalachian Trail. Would any of your listeners want to volunteer to take his hiking boots along the trail? Now, could you imagine being on the receiving end of this? When I first heard this story, I was like, tears were coming out of my eyes just thinking about, you know, how amazing that would be to kind of help someone fulfill that end dream. And as it turns out, that story uh, from Malin had more than 400 people who listened to that podcast volunteer to complete the Appalachian Trail with Paul's Boots. And as it turned out, the company REI was also listening. And REI was so moved by the story um, that, get this, REI did not even make the boots that Paul had, but they were so motivated by the story that they wanted to sponsor this initiative and they also asked if they could bring a kind of a film crew to document the stories of the hikers. And you might be wondering, well, why would a company be part of this if they didn't even make the product at the heart of the story? Well, REI's kind of overarching brand story is about opting outside, getting people to enjoy the great outdoors. And this is a lifestyle story about the hiking community. It's about Paul, it's about his dreams, about his love for hiking, but it's also about just a community of strangers that would volunteer to essentially fulfill kind of one of his lifelong dreams without even knowing him. And REI was just so touched by that and the response, and that to them really spoke about kind of what they stand for as a company. People who are passionate about the outdoors will help strangers enjoy the outdoors and, and much more. So this has turned into a 37 minute documentary called Paul's Boots. Um, I highly encourage that you, if you're interested in seeing a great kind of longer form brand story come to life, that you check it out. You can find it on YouTube and, or you can tweet me or message me on any social media channel. I'll happily send you the link but it's a very powerful example of how stories can truly move and motivate people to take action. Now, another great example of what, is, what makes a great brand story is great brand stories hook us by sharing something unexpected. And an example of this that is more product focused comes from Land Rover. So you can see here on screen, these are vintage 1957 Land Rovers, and we're now traveling to the Indian Himalayas. We're incredibly up high in the mountains, and Land Rover, for their 70th anniversary as a company, uh, shared this incredible story called The Land of Land Rovers. And the story trans transports us to this village in the Hin Indian Himalayas where a fleet of drivers volunteer to drive some of the most treacherous roads in the world 
um, imagine that you're basically almost um, traversing like a cliff and tons and tons of hairpin turns. But the video shares the story of these drivers and it also shares the story of what the Land Rover vehicles mean to the community. Because these vehicles can climb some of the most dangerous roads in the world, they essentially serve as a lifeline to the villagers in these remote areas, transporting both supplies and people between the villages. And without a vehicle that could do this, life would be incredibly difficult um, in these villages. And this, is, this brand story is a great example of how often as companies, we want to kind of tell stories about ourselves, but when a customer tells your story, it's incredibly powerful. You know, nowhere in this video are tons and tons of overt product messages or kind of sales messages. You're hearing straight from the source in their own words, kind of how they've kept, how they've kept these vehicles meticulously, meticulously maintained and kind of what they mean to the community. And it also hooks us because who would have predicted that this would be a story that this small village would rely on Land Rover? And at the end of the day, from the Land Rover brand perspective, you know, if you think about what Land Rover gains from this, well, if you can have a vehicle that's been maintained to last for over 60 years because they date back to 1957, that shows a lot of great longevity and quality craftsmanship for the vehicle, as well as, you know, if you were someone that really needs a vehicle that can handle incredibly difficult terrain, I think you know where to go. So another great uh, tip is that great brand stories keep it real. They do not project a desired image. And the point I want to make here is a lot of times when I work with clients, they come to me and say, you know, we need a story that basically makes us look good. Or, you know, we have, there's a misconception about our business. We're trying to combat an issue and we need a story to solve the problem or to, or to shift the perception in a different direction. And the point I wanna make is that storytelling is not a band-aid to fix what is wrong with your business, but what storytelling can do if there is a problem or a negative situation, it can actually document the journey and allow you a platform to show how you're making those improvements. And I have a very comical example, but also a serious brand crisis example to share with you, which comes from KFC. So in the UK and Ireland in early 2018, KFC actually ran out of chicken and they started to see some very spirited uh, posts on social media, such as KFC have run out of chicken this is how the apocalypse starts. Or disaster, took the grandkids to dinner only to see that it shut down some chicken short shortage. Crying in the bathroom, can't show weakness in front of them. People actually called their local police departments to complain about KFC being out of chicken, to which the police had to put out a public statement saying, your local fast food chain running out of chicken is not a police issue. So people were, you know, this, to put it in numerical context, this uh, story reached 80% of adults in the UK. It closed down 750 KFC restaurants and 19,000 employees were impacted. So in terms of a brand crisis, this was a pretty big deal. And typically what happens in a brand crisis is companies just put out a PR statement and just try and ride out the crisis and you know, they know the news cycle will change at some point. But KFC didn't do that. They actually decided to not shy away from the crisis and instead honestly told their story throughout. So I love how they used visuals on social media to tell their story. So in a crisis situation, social media and its real-time nature is a great platform for storytelling and specifically for kind of sharing and responding how you're managing it. So they posted some very kind of clever visuals saying the chicken crossed the road, just not to one of our restaurants. And they addressed the issue, which was actually the onboarding of a new delivery partner who apparently was having teething problems namely getting fresh chicken to 900 restaurants. Apparently that was a little too complicated for them and that's what sparked the crisis. 
But what they did is every day they had a different update for how they were working towards this crisis and when people could expect to see restaurants reopening. And they also had a micro, like a landing page on their website, which was showing which stores were closed and which were opened. And they also changed, they took out a full page ad in a number of the UK and Ireland's newspapers, which changed their famous name KFC to the letters FCK. So I think we all understand what that stands for, especially when paired with an empty bucket of chicken. And the ad basically reads as a heartfelt apology. And this resonated extremely well with KFC's customer base. And you know the old adage about how, you know, when you can't get something, you want it even more. Well, that kind of sentiment combined with how they responded to the crisis actually built up a huge amount of demand for KFC and their business did incredibly well when they could reopen again. So let's delve a little bit deeper into what types of stories you can tell. We've already gone through a little bit about what makes a good story, but let's start breaking down the different types of stories that companies tell. So companies tell two main types of stories, macro stories and micro stories. Now macro stories are at the core of your organization's DNA. They highlight your company's story, its founding myth. Now, the way I like to explain macro stories is think about macro stories as your why. Why are you in business? Why are you doing what you're doing? What is your company mission, your vision, your values, your goals? That all of those kind of come together to create your macro story. Now your micro story, on the other hand, those are the lifeblood of your storytelling strategy. They're an always on approach to building on that macro story. So if you think about macro stories as an umbrella, essentially if you have those overarching macro stories as your umbrella, then the micro stories would be the ones that fill in under that umbrella, layer up into it, they complement it and are an extension of it, but it allows you to go a bit deeper on different topics. And you might be wondering, okay, Jess, but show me some examples. Well, I'm so glad you asked. So Tom's is the one for one company. That is their macro story. For every pair of shoes that you buy, they donate a pair of shoes to a child in need. And when you start to break this down and look across their micro stories, they stay pretty consistent actually. Everything is mission driven and very focused on kind of the, the cause and the mission at hand. But I'll share some examples with you. So for example, in some of Tom's stores, they use virtual reality headsets to take people on virtual giving trips. So you can put the VR headsets on, you can be transported to Peru or Argentina or one of the many places around the world where they donate shoes to children in need. And the great thing is by kind of using that immersive VR experience, the end consumer gets a feel for what those giving trips are like, what those places around the world are like, and actually seeing the faces and the smiles of the people that Tom's is helping also reinforces kind of why consumers are supporting that company. And another example is on social media, they've done an annual campaign called one day without shoes, where they challenge people to go a day without shoes to document their experience and to post a picture of their bare feet on social media. And it's a really powerful customer storytelling initiative because by having people share those kind of firsthand experiences, obviously, you know, some parts of it are quite positive, but some, you know, trying to imagine getting to work without shoes, that's really difficult. And what Tom's did is for every person who posted a photo of their bare feet, they donated a pair of shoes to a child in need during that campaign window, up to 1 million. So it's just a great example of how Tom's can go a little bit deeper into kind of different types of stories around their mission while staying true to that macro story. 
Now, another example of a company that I think is phenomenal at storytelling is GE or General Electric. Now, GE's purpose is around innovation in STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And what I love about GE is, you know, they're in a much more technical and quote unquote less sexy industry, but they have some of the most creative approaches to content and storytelling and marketing. And I'll share some examples with you. So over the course of COVID-19, GE has been telling stories about how volunteers within the company with specialties that are relevant to kind of um, helping to build medical equipment, for example, how people within the company are volunteering to help during that time. One of those gentlemen is Tyler, who is apparently a ventilator expert. And what GE has done is they've shared a video, a firsthand video that um, Tyler actually filmed on kind of a dashboard cam on his car of him kind of going through his day to help build ventilators for medical facilities. And what I think GE does really well with how they package their storytelling is you see the video, there's audio, but as a lot of people don't actually listen to the audio on videos, you know, say if you're trying to look at something at your desk at work, uh, they also subtitle the videos. And they also have a link to a blog post where people can delve much deeper into the story if that's interesting to them. Now, some other examples of the micro stories that they tell are around GE Ventures, which is working with a company called Nexar to build artificially intelligent dashboard cams for your car to help predict and prevent car collisions. Or I also think they do a phenomenal job with employee storytelling and they've run a number of initiatives where employees take over different social media channels. So Clay here works, is an advanced manufacturing engineer for GE Power, and he's taking over the Facebook page for a day to give people a behind the scenes look at the first step in building HA gas turbines. So yes, this is very technical, but if that's something you're interested in, you know, maybe you want to work at GE or, that's, you know, you're a customer of GE's or a prospective customer. Um, this is something that might be interesting to you and you can really go on a deep dive. And there is research that shows that when kind of employees do the storytelling, there is um, a very big kind of lift in engagement. And even more so if employees are sharing stories or content from your company on their own social media channels. So the last example I want to share around macro versus micro stories comes from Dunkin' Donuts. You know, I couldn't not include some Dunkin' examples in this presentation. Now, Dunkin's macro story is around keeping busy, on-the-go customers running. We've all heard the tagline, America runs on Dunkin'. You know, Dunkin' is for the average Jane and Joe, and everything they do is, is very customer-centric. So how does this transpire into some of those micro stories? Well, what the micro stories do for Duncan is they allow them to go a bit deeper and go behind the scenes because while with the macro story, you see a lot of kind of customer stories and, you know, stories around how products keep people running. But while I was working for Duncan, we love taking people behind the scenes in the secret test kitchen. No joke, you actually have to ring a doorbell and hope that they'll let you in. It's that secretive. So we thought, why not bring people in there and kind of put a human face on the culinary team? Because often people see this big corporate company, but actually there's so many amazing people who actually have cool job titles like manager of donut excellence or manager of coffee excellence. And they're a mix of actual culinary professionals, so professional chefs who worked at restaurants, many of us have dined at, as well as kind of scientists and beverage technologists. So actually having them tell the story of the inspiration behind a product or maybe sharing what they could around kind of how they get the flavor formulation or how kind of a new donut comes to market. Those are all really interesting stories and interesting ways to talk about a product in a way that's not salesy. You know, when the manager of Donut Excellence is telling you about kind of how he seeks inspiration for new donut flavors, that's pretty cool. Um, and actually, we saw some examples with some of the storytelling we did on the Duncan blog the news media would actually pick up some of those interviews that we did and quote us in articles that actually happened in the Wall Street Journal for 
one of the um, for one of the new products that we launched, and I was like, I've gotten my gold star for the day. Thank you very much. But other occasions that we look at are very customer centric. So, for example, we did a lot of research around well, outside of our brand and our products, what do our customers care about? And we started looking at things like sports, entertainment, pop culture, lifestyle. And one of the trends that we saw was around holiday occasions. We realized, you know, there's so many holidays throughout the year that our customers want to celebrate. And how could we tell stories around those in an interesting way? So we did a Halloween coffee cup decorating contest. We asked people who should Duncan dress up as for Halloween. And we got some really amazing submissions like this 1920s flapper coffee cup. And we started kind of creating stories around those characters and how they were celebrating Halloween. And that became a very fun social media initiative. And we ran it as a contest where we gave away gift cards as prizes. And we got a lot of feedback from parents saying, thanks for giving me something fun to do with my kids this weekend. So an extra, an extra bonus. But Duncan also has a big um, kind of need to go local because what you see with Duncan in Boston could be different than what you see in LA, Miami, Berlin, Indonesia. You know, Duncan is in so many different countries around the world. It's actually one of my favorite things to do when I travel is to go to Dunkin' Donuts in a different country. And a lot of what we did was try to see if there were interesting stories happening from local, uh, local to the US or international markets. And one example comes from a drive-through in Massachusetts, actually. So not all that kind of far flung, but we started seeing that customers were paying for the order of the car behind them uh, in line, essentially paying it forward. And we found that when this ha would happen, it would spark a chain reaction. It was at one Dunkin' Donuts uh, restaurant. And we shared this story on our blog and social media channels. And then we started seeing it popping up at other markets around the United States because people were so inspired that, wow, I could actually make somebody's day by just buying their cup of coffee for them. And then when that happens to you, you wanna do it to the next person. So we actually kind of sparked a trend and we moved people to participate in this trend through our storytelling. So I started to share a little bit about kind of the different types of stories that you can tell, but let's dig a little bit deeper on where you can source great stories from. So a common thing that I hear when I'm working with people is, but Jessica, nobody ever shares anything cool with me. You always cite all these great examples, but like uh, it's crickets here at my company. Well, I'm gonna give you the harsh, brutal truth is you have to create a culture that you know, starts to coach and educate people around what makes a great story. And you also have to think like a journalist within your organization to source great stories. And what I've done when I'm working at companies is I've started to kind of suss out who would be interesting, you know, who might be departments that are kind of the keepers of interesting stories. So like the product team, the culinary team, if you're in the food business, uh, could be the sales team, could be the customer account management team the public relations team, brand managers, you know, these are all people that have kind of the keys and human resources as well to interesting stories. And I would have a monthly meeting with them and I would come ready in that meeting with questions and just, you know, have a conversation. Cause if you just say, do you have any good stories with me? You know, you have to kind of coach people and share, you know, we're, we're trying to think if there's any interesting stories we could tell about human resources. Could you tell me about some of the things you're working on? And that's where you start to kind of learn. And the more people open up, the more great stories unfold. And then the more they start to see them shared across different company channels, the more that creates that culture. Um, but to kind of add a little bit of humor to this, I've also added a very purposefully eye-watering slide. Um, I'm happy to share these slides after, or you can take some screen grabs while I'm talking. So I'll, I'll linger on this for a little bit. But Basically, you can source stories from customers, employees. What about your company values, your products, pop culture trends, even your company history? There's a reason why people use that hashtag TBT or Throwback Thursday. People love knowing about kind of, you know, what your company's history is. You also could look at trending topics online and if you have a story to share around that. 
could be an award your company has won. Um, you could work with influencers to have them kind of experience something about your brand or your business and share kind of their firsthand story. Uh, data is also a great way to source stories. And I know you're having a session tomorrow on data-driven storytelling, which I think will really dig deeply into that. Um, but could also be Google search trends, could be um, media inquiries, or even kind of innovation projects in your company. There's so many different examples. But I'll share a few more just to kind of get your wheels churning. So an example from um, human resources is, um, you know, I, and actually before I jump into that, a point I wanna make is not all stories have to come from, you know, your products or your marketing or your public relations team. Great stories can come from any department. And, you know, human resources is one department that always seems to kind of know kind of great employee stories, but also can do different storytelling campaigns. And one that L'Oreal did on LinkedIn was, they actually created a, um, an extension of their website where they had a landing page and they asked uh, candidates to pick a different inword. And all of these inwords were kind of words that L'Oreal deemed to be values that you might need to work at L'Oreal, such as entrepreneur, inter international, inviting, insightful. They even have the word intense there, which I'm wondering about that one a bit, um, what that says about company culture. But as a kind of candidate, you could you could pick an N word. I picked the word entrepreneur, and it created this really cool visual that says, "I am in with your LinkedIn uh, profile picture," and you were allowed to share a little story that complemented why you picked that word. And not only is that a great kind of way to help you know people who love your brand and follow your your business create content on LinkedIn, but it's also great in terms of talent recruitment because. Through this, L'Oreal was capturing email addresses and you also had the opportunity to upload your resume or what we call CV here in Europe. So we talked a little bit as well about data. Well, how can data turn into storytelling? Well, Spotify visualizes user data in a very hilarious way. So if you're a Spotify user, at the end of each year, you get a kind of an email from Spotify that shows some of your interesting listening trends from the year, basically your most played songs, but they also anonymize that data and they pulled some interesting and humorous nuggets from that. So an example is, dear person who played Sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day, what did you do? And all of these kind of uh, data insights about listening trends can be shaped into stories. And Spotify used this across social media and billboards, as well as other storytelling initiatives. Now, some folks listening might say, well, hey, Jessica, you know, I'm B2B or, you know, I can't do kind of some of the crazier things that consumer brands can do. Well, first and foremost, I call uh, BS on that. Um, but second, you know, I also think for B2B brands, there's a lot of ways you can use thought leadership to tell amazing stories. And even though I'm using a more of a consumer brand here, Experian, because they are in the consumer financial services space, you know, I think this is a very relevant example for B2B. And what they do is they host a weekly credit chat and they bring in internal and external experts to delve deeper into different kind of financial services topics like how to rebuild and raise your credit scores. And what I love about this is they go live on social media. They also create a slide share presentation, which is what you see here on the screen, which any PowerPoint presentation can be turned into a SlideShare presentation. SlideShare is owned by LinkedIn, it's embeddable in blogs, and it also gets a huge amount of organic search traffic as well. So, you know, without a lot of design skills or um, kind of a lot of, you know, too much kind of investment, you can create these amazing kind of visual eBooks on SlideShare on different thought leadership topics that you can then share and use to support kind of storytelling and thought leadership across different channels. But what about customer care? So we did a crisis example earlier from KFC, but I've seen some really brilliant examples from Tesco who actually tap customer care cases for storytelling. And an example that I'd like to introduce you to comes from Wes and William the Worm. Now, Wes was trying to make a cucumber sandwich, and much to his dismay, 
he discovered in his cucumber was a dead worm. And he decided to post a very comical response um, complaining to Tesco on their Facebook page and said, you know, I excitedly shouted to the kids downstairs to come and meet our new pet. Although unfortunately, after 24 hours, we realized that they've named the worm William. Uh, William has not moved and he, we think he's dead. I now have three very upset children a worm funeral to plan, and to top it all off, I've lost my taste for cucumber sandwiches, which everyone knows are known to be a favorite at any week. So come on, Tesco, how are you gonna wiggle your way out of this one? Now, not only did Tesco wiggle their way out of this one, they did so in the most epically creative way. So on the same thread that Wes originally posted his customer complaint on, Rob from Tesco's customer care wrote a poem to celebrate William, basically an ode to William the Worm, which actually got 27,000 likes on just that one comment on a Facebook thread. So 30, almost 30,000 people were looking at this Facebook thread about this customer care complaint. Then Wes and his family decided to host William a Worm funeral with artistic depictions, as well as the sympathy card that was sent from Tesco in the mail and Basically, what they said is, it's been an emotional day, but the funeral went without a hitch. Tesco Rob, we read your poem and there wasn't a dry eye amongst us. And, you know, essentially this, you know, these kind of customer care inquiries don't always happen, but Tesco's tried to create a reputation. Um, and I should mention, sorry, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Tesco is a supermarket in the UK, so they sell um, food items. Um, but basically Tesco's tried to create a culture where they respond more colorfully and more creatively when they can to customer service complaints. And that allows them to turn some of these complaints into more kind of humorous stories. And there's been many examples like this because once customers have seen that they might do this for another customer, it sparks the customer to be creative with their response to hope that they maybe get kind of a fun and quirky response as well. So let's go a little bit deeper into how we craft those stories. Um, so what are the components of a good story? You know, we've started to see some of these elements or the examples that I've shared in this presentation, but I recommend starting with your why. Now compared to your why with your macro stories, you have to ask here, why is this story interesting? Because a lot of times companies want to put stories out that are self-serving and we really need to ask, why is this story interesting to our end audience? And you know, the big why could be, it could be a big reveal, it could be a surprise, overcoming or taking on a challenge, delivering on a customer request, taking a stance on an issue, or even kind of sparking some emotions like humor, uh, sadness, and more. But having kind of a good why and a good hook, you know, what makes this st story worth tuning into? You have to start with that. And then what I recommend doing is saying, well, what is the key message or takeaway that you want the reader or viewer to remember? And, you know, I always like to say that great storytellers play to their audience, but great storytellers also know how to keep the message concise and easy to understand. So I recommend really looking at not overwhelming people with too many details or too many kind of twists and turns of the story, really thinking about the simplicity of that key message, consistency of that message, and also clarity, how easy is it for people to understand what your key message or takeaway is? And then really digging deeper into that emotional connection. We talked a lot at the beginning about how stories can spark our emotions and that emotional connection with your audience is so important if you wanna move and motivate people to take action. So examples here, I really think when you're crafting that story, you know, when you're thinking about how you wanna roll that story out, you also wanna think about how you want them to feel. Do you want them to feel inspired, challenged, trusting, humorous, empathetic, even sadness? Because how you then roll out that story and kind of the tone that you take with that storytelling narrative, as well as some of those supporting visual and kind of musical elements will really help you um, kind of spark those desired emotions, which leads me into my next point, which is, well, what is the journey? You know, thinking about, you know, what are the key elements in that journey that are going to hook people and keep them, um, 
keep them hooked throughout the story. So we see a lot, you know, of feedback that people have very short attention spans online. And that is true. But also think about the fact that many of us, myself included, will binge watch like an entire um, season of a show on Netflix in a day, right? So if we're really hooked, and if you think about kind of why we get hooked on those Netflix shows, it's because we want to know what happens next, right? So how are you going to structure that journey of your story? So people want to stay tuned to find out what happens next. And some things that I recommend looking at, and again, this is very high level, is a powerful intro. You know, really looking at your story flow. How will that build to keep people's attention? Focus on those supporting visuals, which I'm going to get into in my last point. Um, also those sensory elements, you know, audio, music, cinematography, all of those comes in to kind of keeping our attention, but also sparking our emotions. And then also ending with a call to action. You know, we've talked about the clarity of the message and the key takeaway, but how do you want to end that's also going to support moving and motivating people to take that action? So the next point and the last point that I want to make is using different channels and visuals to bring stories to life. So did you know that 90% of information that's transmitted to the brain is visual? Or that visuals are actually processed 60,000 times faster than text alone? Just as we as humans are hardwired to favor storytelling and connect through storytelling, our brains are also hardwired to process information visually. So this is not to say that, you know, podcasts or blogs or people who write books like yours truly, that kind of the written word isn't relevant, but visuals can be used in a very strategic way to keep people's attention and also kind of keep them hooked during that story. So we're now kind of, we're now in an environment where we have so many different visuals that we can leverage like photos or videos, animated GIFs, a humorous meme. What about a cinemagraph, which is the hybrid of an image and a video? And essentially with a cinemagraph, it looks like a still image, but only one element is in constant motion. So it really pulls you into a focal point, which can support, you know, something you're trying to drive people's attention to in a story. What about infographics to tell a data story? You see the visual on screen from Bloomberg, which is a national Pi Day infographic, which goes into different commodity prices around the ingredients of Pi. Interesting. Um, and we also talked about slideshare presentations, which can be these visual ebooks for telling a story. But here's the thing where you tell your story also shapes how you tell it. And I firmly believe that every channel is an opportunity to tell your story. So I've recently discovered oat milk. I am obsessed and I really love Oatly. Um, hashtag not sponsored, but um, I was pouring my morning coffee one day and I look at the side of the bottle and I'm like, what? A message from the cult? And I, you know, bleary eyed, I immediately caught my attention and I delved a bit deeper and Oatly essentially uses their packaging for storytelling. So I firmly believe if you have some space on that package, telling stories through your packaging is a great way to get people's attention. But Oatly doesn't just rely on its packaging to tell stories. They also use many different channels. One that I thought was really fantastic is they have an Instagram account dedicated to barista stories. So while they are direct to, to consumer, you can buy their products at grocery stores. They also have a huge B2B business where they sell into coffee shops. And I mean, hey, as you know, I'm, I love myself some you know coffee marketing and I love coffee. But what I really loved about this is it, the Instagram account is essentially a way to discover really amazing niche coffee shops around the world and the stories of the different baristas who work at them. So while this is meant as more of a B2B initiative, I also think it's incredibly interesting to consumers who love kind of craft coffee and love the art of coffee and also want to know maybe when they're traveling or in their local market where they can get kind of an interesting or great cup of coffee made with Oatly. So the example I want to end on is comes from KFC and KFC truly shows that the magic is in the storytelling mix and KFC uses channels to tell stories. I think like no other, 
And because I also shared their brand crisis earlier in the presentation, I thought I would end the presentation on some positive examples of the great marketing and storytelling they're doing on a positive note. So KFC actually released a romance novella called Tender Wings of Desire in celebration of Mother's Day because they decided that mother, that mom needed kind of a juicy, um, a juicy story as well as a bucket of chicken wings. I might have done this campaign for Valentine's Day for your sweetheart, but to each their own. But it stars Colonel Helen Sanders. They released it on Amazon for free. And it was just a very hilarious story that kind of tied back into their brand and kind of incorporated, you know, Colonel Harlan Sanders and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, KFC also has a LinkedIn page for their founder. So I'm very proudly a first connection of Colonel Holland Sanders on LinkedIn. And what I thought was so clever is you actually can read his story on his LinkedIn page. And what I thought was super interesting is, you know, he didn't actually found KFC until he was 65 years old. And he describes that he did a whole mess of other jobs poorly, like he was a streetcar conductor, he was a railroad man, he sold tires, he delivered babies, he ran for political office, all before discovering at age 65, he finally found the thing he could do better than anyone in the world, which is cook fried chicken. Um, so a lot of advice I give, you know, when I, when I share this example with startups that I work with is if your founder is not, you know, kind of sharing an in interesting story about how your business was founded on LinkedIn, Use that real estate because people are always curious whether it's the C-suite of an organization or the founder of a startup. This is a great opportunity to tell your story. And then last but certainly not least is um, to promote a new product launch on extra crispy bucket of fried chicken. KFC released a limited time only extra crispy sunscreen that no joke actually smells like chicken. And they use this as a way to tell a story around the product launch um, and also to drum up some excitement with their consumer base. And KFC has done kind of this limited time product launches across um, so many different types of quirky brand items. It's become a signature of their marketing, but it's a really nice way when paired with a product launch to tell a very unique brand story. So to wrap up so we can get to those questions, telling great stories comes from a strong sense of who you are and your purpose. There's an art and science to uncovering great stories. Go beyond the obvious, look across your company, your customers, your values, even key issues to shape powerful stories. I highly recommend test, learn, optimize, and repeat with your storylines, your visuals, and your channel mix. Sometimes it takes a little while to find your groove, but I think by testing a lot of different types of stories and visuals and ways to tell them and channels to deliver them on, that's when you really find your sweet spot. And then last but certainly not least, put your customers at the center of everything you do for long-term success. Great storytellers play to their audience. And I hope today that I've done a good job playing to this audience. So if you'd like to reach out to me, I've put my contact details here on the screen or I'm on every social media channel so you can find me pretty much anywhere. So thanks again and let's jump into the question portion. Thank you, Jessica. This is awesome. I'm going to be looking at all of the marketing and ads and social media for companies so much more differently now and knowing the secret sauce behind things. Um, but let's definitely jump into some questions. I'm going to start with one that was pre-submitted because I think it's very relevant for today. So obviously we're in this global pandemic and uh, we have someone who's wondering, how do you straddle marketing yourself, your business, your product without coming across as profiting from a pandemic? Oh, this is such a great question. Um, so I've actually, um, I have been doing a lot of work around this with companies. And, you know, I think what we've seen with COVID-19 is when the pandemic started, everyone hit pause. You know, it, it's, it's, you have to, whenever there's a crisis, a pandemic, any sort of kind of national news item of you know kind of very intense prominence in the world you have to take a step back and reassess kind of you're always on marketing your storytelling you know everything that you're doing across customer facing channels and what we saw a lot of businesses do was was hit the pause button and you know reassess kind of how it made sense to pivot and the advice that i gave to people is 
that, you know, especially at the beginning of COVID when it was, you know, we didn't know kind of what was next, you had to pivot. You know, it's, it's not appropriate to kind of be, you know, spamming people with tons of salesy posts and kind of product and marketing centric messages and stories during that time. Instead, you know, what, I, what a lot of companies has done, have done and what I recommend is, you know, really starting to assess the new, the new normal in the current state and assessing kind of what's relevant. So, you know, for example, you saw a lot of businesses reevaluating, you know, how relevant is my product or service during this time? How can I talk about it? And what's the right way to talk about it? Also documenting their journey of, of dealing with COVID-19 because employees were impacted, supply chains were impacted. So, you know, a bit of tactical um, and practical kind of communications around, you know, we might have slower delivery times, you know, there might, you know, we might have to kind of, you know, take your customer service calls from home. Um, and sharing some of those employee stories around that, I think was very helpful. And then I think now, you know, we're seeing, depending where you are in the world, things are starting to come back to life. So, you know, during that time where maybe we saw a lot of visual imagery, you know, about kind of, you know, respecting social isolation, um, you know, now you're starting to see maybe the tone of communications and stories reflecting that, you know, gearing back up to reopen stores or to kind of, you know, kind of launch new products. And, and there's, you know, I think that's where you kind of see the flow. And that's what I would recommend is just being very sensitive and empathetic to what's going on, asking where your business, you know, plays, plays a role, seeing what your customers need or need to hear from you at that time. Um, using visual imagery and stories that kind of reflect people's current state. So no, no images of people crowded on the beach during this time until that's socially acceptable again. And then starting to re-pivot back. Now, I also received some feedback during that time because I know a lot of businesses were severely impacted and people saying, but I have to sell, I have to sell my products. And the advice I was giving is, you know, you can still sell in a way without going for the overt sell by telling your story of how you're doing during this time. You're still selling what you're doing. You're still sharing what you're doing, um, but you're doing so in a way that is just more respectful. So, you know, the, the flip side of doing super salesy posts is offending your customers who aren't going to want to buy from you versus saying, well, actually, you know, we had to pause operations or we might have some shipping delays, but we're working really hard. Here's what we're doing in our factories. And also, especially if you were doing anything to support, you know, medical workers or support communities or support people that were impacted, those are also phenomenal stories to tell during this time. Great recommendations. Thank you. One of our other um, participants today said, fascinating and inspiring talk. Stories are personal and so close to human emotion. Do you have your own personal guidelines to inspire and help consumers through stories, but at the same time not exploit their vulnerabilities? Yeah, so this is where, you know, this is where stories need to be genuine. So like we saw kind of the Paul's Boots story, that is a real life true story. Or even the Land of Land Rover story, it's just so inspiring because it's a real story. And you, you, you hear through the voices of the, the different drivers on, you know, our life would not be what it was like today without Land Rover. And, and I, I think, you know, we, we've certainly seen a climate in social media with Cambridge Analytica and how we've seen kind of political campaigns with, with, with people trying to use messages to manipulate people. And the best advice I can give you is if you can keep it real and genuine to your business, you know, a story from your company, a story from a customer, I think that's always going to hit the right note. I think when it becomes inappropriate and self-serving um, is when you're trying to pretend to be something that you're not to shift your perception in, in a different way. And I don't recommend doing that. There's been a lot of high profile brand fails. Like for example, the Kendall Jenner campaign with Pepsi around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, Pepsi is an amazing brand and they just, they had a huge misstep with that because it wasn't true and genuine to their business. And the way they told that story was not aligned with how customers perceived them. So I think what I would also add is, you know, the more you know how you're perceived by your customers, you know, for example, if your customer service is not good and you get a lot of complaints about it, don't kind of put out stories about, you know, how great you are at resolving issues. Or if you, if there's known problems with the product, don't try and put out um, a marketing campaign or a storytelling campaign 
trying to bait and switch people. You know, instead, maybe put a story saying, thanks for your feedback on some issues you're having with this product. Here's what we've done to rectify them. And we take your feedback seriously. We want you, we want to deliver a good experience for you. That's what's going to help you sell more products. That makes me think of that Domino's campaign where they really turned all that negative feedback into a positive and how they were addressing customer concerns. So um, speaking of things not to do, another participant wants to know, do you have a list of don'ts um, <laughs> in brand storytelling? Oh gosh, I mean, I'm sure if you put me on a whiteboard, I could come up with right. a lot of them. <laughs> but, but I think what I would say in terms of high level stuff is really keep it genuine to your business. I always recommend starting with that overarching macro story. Um, and then if you're just starting out, like take the pulse of what's happening in your business. You know, if you're thinking like that journalist within your organization, the more you can stay attuned to kind of how the business is communicating and kind of, you know, what's happening within your company and your customers, that's going to help you stay on a safer path. Um, I think when companies get into trouble is when they try to like, you know, a lot of times like trending topics on social media can be a minefield for companies. And I will say, you know, the recent uh, Blackout Tuesday, you know, as much as, you know, you know, I, I posted my kind of bl black square on Instagram, I'm very supportive of this, you know, with companies that I work for, you know, essentially, it's such an amazing initiative to support. Uh, but what ends up happening is if your company, you know, is not kind of a diverse company, does not, you know, does not actually have, you know, we saw some very kind of high profile news articles filed about um, companies that were kind of coming out in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, but actually were making donations to organizations that do not support that movement and actually lobby against that movement. And, you know, it becomes a situation where you really have to have all of your business operations and how you run your company aligned with the issue that you want to support. So I think before you come out in support of an issue, you know, you need to do that diligence. And if you find out that your company you know, has a lot of room to grow and has improvements, talk about your support for the issue in that way, saying, you know, today we are supporting Blackout Tuesday, but we do so knowing that we have, a, we have a lot of changes we have to make, and this is what we're doing to do that. So, you know, again, I think it's before you jump on a trending topic, before you put out kind of a mass statement, really make sure that ties back to your organizational values and the reality of your business. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, I think you've answered all the questions that have been submitted and we're really appreciative of your time. As Jessica shared, she's on all the social media platforms. You can, I know I've connected as well. Um, and then on Thursday, as mentioned, we'll have another storytelling angle, more around the data um, behind storytelling to complement today's session. So thanks again, Jessica, for your time. We really appreciate it. Great. And thank you all for tuning in today. It was such an honor to be here. Have a great day, everyone.